Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, taking this time to join us on a very wintry Tuesday uh, for a special lunch and learn about the 2022-23 Collaborative Quality Improvement uh, Programs um, and the overview of the collaborative quips, as well as some supports that are available for you with them. Our uh, Panelists today are uh, Dr. David Kaplan, Chief of Clinical Quality from Ontario Health, and Mark Robson, Manager of Quality Improvement Integrated Care and Value Based Care, uh, also from Ontario Health. Um, before I turn you over to them, uh, we've got a bit of housekeeping to cover. Uh, so, most of you are very familiar with Zoom by now and don't need uh, a lot of walkthrough, but just because we're a large, very large group today, I want you to, um, I want to just let you know that our microphones will be kept muted throughout the presentation. Um, and so we'd ask you to use the chat function to share any questions or comments uh, that you have. And you can access that through the little speech bubble icon in your Zoom control bar. Uh, live captioning is available, so there should be a, a something that says CC live transcript. Uh, if you click that button, that should turn on the live captioning. If you have any technical issues, um, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, please feel free to send a direct message to me. My name is Catherine or Sandeep, um, and we will uh, provide you with some support. So before we go any further, I do want to just take a couple of moments to acknowledge our presence on Indigenous territory. The work of the Alliance and our members takes place on the traditional territories of the Indigenous nations who've lived on these lands since time immemorial. The land that settlers call Ontario is covered by 46 treaties, agreements and land purchases, as well as unceded territories. The Alliance and the home office where I work are located in Toronto on lands that are the traditional homes of the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee. This is Dish With One Spoon Treaty territory. This land is now home to many indigenous peoples who live here alongside settlers, newcomers and people whose ancestors were enslaved across the Americas and the Caribbean. We are grateful to live and work here and we acknowledge the impacts of our colonial history and the impacts that our continued presence and activities here have on the Indigenous nations for whom this is home. Doing this in a meaningful way means making commitments to sharing and upholding our responsibilities to all who now live on these lands, to the land itself, the water, the animals, and the resources that make our lives possible. It means considering the impacts of our words and actions on those who were and continue to be marginalized by colonialism. In our work, let us always remain mindful of these commitments. Um, and with that, I am going to turn you over to uh, Mark and uh, Mark Robson. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Um, really appreciate the introductions and uh, appreciate actually being invited to come and join you today. Um, this is uh, this is great to have so many people that are interested to find out uh, about the Collaborative Quality Improvement Plan, uh, and so we're going to do our best to uh, describe it um, and describe some of the supports that are available, uh, and uh, and and then participate in questions uh, that follow. So uh, pleased to be here, and thank you so much. Um, just on the next slide, uh, if we just look at the agenda uh, for today, um, we really just uh, we've gone through some of the introductions. Uh, at, at the outset. I wonder if, um, Catherine, everybody's muted, right? So um, uh, do we know uh, who is here from, uh, like that's representing uh, AFTO members, NPLCA members, IPHCC members? Um, or if, if not, we can, uh, we can potentially circulate um, uh, what the membership was after, um, after the session today. Certainly. We have, I think, about 35 people here from AFTO member organizations, about 50 from Alliance member organizations, about a dozen from um, IPHCC member organizations, and a small number uh, from uh, nurse practitioner-led clinics. So it is a pretty diverse group. We also have a few people from uh, hospitals and other organizations uh, that are here as OHT partners. 
Okay, great. And then I think we have a poll slide coming up soon to, uh, to ask who's uh, who's a member of an OHT. So, yeah, as we um, uh, so we'll we'll get through the uh, the agenda. So I'll speak a bit about uh, and with a bit of an overview of the QIP um, and the areas of focus and the indicators, uh, and then a brief description about how data is attributed, uh, and then uh, we'll move into some of the supports that are available. Uh, David will take over at that time. Um, and uh, some examples about how primary care organizations uh, are engaged in developing their collaborative quality promote plans. Um, so the next slide is the poll question. So yeah, if we want to launch the poll, uh, this is just to see who um, uh, in the group, uh, if you're involved in an OHD or not. And so three easy choices, yes, no, or unsure. Um, and we'll just give a bit of time for folks to, um, uh, to respond to that. People were pretty quick on the draw there. So we've got awesome. 100 percent answered already. Oh, okay. no, that's a lie. 57 percent. Okay, let's just give a couple more minutes. Okay. A few more seconds, sorry. And so when it's done, Catherine, are we able to, uh, to see I'll, the results or yeah, are you I'll yeah. share the results with you when it comes to this if you a few little trickles still coming in, um, but I'm gonna five more seconds, we're gonna end the poll. Okay, so you can see there, um, vast majority are in OHTs. Wonderful, that's great. Okay, so good. So I mean, this uh, this session is going to be relevant to um, to hopefully everybody that's here. And so uh, again, hope hope that it will be uh, worth your time. Um, so yeah, I'm going to speak to the CEQIP overview. So that's the next slide. Um, what I wanted to start off uh, here really is um, to hopefully relieve some, some worries. I wanna be really clear at the outset here. We know this is the inaugural year for a collaborative quality improvement plan. Um, and as such, uh, you know, we're taking it as, as a learning year. Um, so you can expect flexibility and support from Ontario Health regarding the development and submission of your first sequence. Uh, and that the program itself will evolve over time to reflect the context of the system uh, and developing OHT maturity over time. Um, and so, you know, just a bit of history, uh, on August 11th, uh, there was a virtual engagement series information session. Um, and at that one, uh, there were three CEQIP uh, areas of focus that we spoke about. Uh, they were profiled and, and the associated indicators for those uh, were shared at the time too. Um, and when these slides have been circulated, which I think they're going to be uh, after the session, You'll be able to click on the link in the information session uh, there to see the full overview of what was uh, covered at that time. Um, there are 50 Ontario Health teams and in November uh, the um, points of contact for each of those teams received uh, the CEQIP guidance document as well as the technical specifications document. Um, and uh, then following that in December um, the submission tool was opened up so the CEQIP navigator um, and the initial data packages uh, for all the teams were uh, released, and that was uh, mid-December. Um, just to note that the data that's included in those organizational um, uh, OHT level data packages are at the OHT level and not the individual organization level. Um, and then finally, uh, just to note that uh, some of you will be familiar with the structure of a organizational quality improvement plan. Um, like that, uh, the CEQIP has a narrative section uh, as well as a work plan. And so there are similarities to the structure. Um, there are certainly differences in the interface uh, and the, um, you know, the submission platforms. Uh, we call them both a, a navigator system uh, for, for uh, developing and submitting the plan. Um, the CEQIP navigator is uh, survey based and is, uh, has been designed to promote collaboration across your team partner sites in uh, developing your plan. Um, and so on the next slide, thank you. Um, just a, a quick overview here. So what I'm hoping to do is uh, the objective here is to have everybody understand what the CEQA priorities uh, and indicators are for this year. Um, and if that's not clear, please do let me know. Uh, and spoiler alert, it doesn't mean everybody here uh, will agree that these are the absolute most appropriate indicators and areas of focus. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's uh, it's a near impossible task. Um, so while acknowledging that no single indicator or uh, issue is perfect for, um, for the, the system at large, 
uh, we believe this set serves to signal how the system is doing broadly and starts to show how um, what can happen when teams start to work together. Uh, and that as the system matures, um, indicators will need to evolve um, and uh, be able to um, provide actionable and useful information for teams uh, that does reflect the approach uh, to care delivery that are taken on by OHDs. Um, also to note that the, these were based, uh, selected based on criteria to ensure that they were relevant to, to you, uh, that they are representative of system issues. Um, and importantly, there is certainly a, a, a theme of COVID recovery uh, that was included in the selection of these indicators. Um, and also to note that they need to be able to be calculated uh, at the attributed population uh, level uh, with that methodology. Um, and I think just to, to focus in on that idea of them being relevant to OHTs, uh, it, that includes the concept um, that these issues all require a collaborative approach across more than a single partner uh, within your teams. Um, and that they are best addressed with plans that involve uh, multiple partners across sectors. Uh, and they're really not the, the work of any individual or individual organization. And so there is a focus, as you can see, uh, the first one is improving access to care in the most appropriate setting. The associated indicator for that is alternate level of care days. Uh, the second area of focus is improving access to community mental health and addiction services. Uh, and so the associated indicator for that is the rate of ED visits as first point of contact for uh, mental health and addiction related care. Um, and then there are three screening indicators uh, to look at um, the concept of improving access to preventative care. Uh, so it's percentage of screen eligible patients up to date with PET tests, percentage of screen eligible patients up to date with mammograms, and percentage of screen eligible patients up to date with colorectal screening. Um, and then uh, just a, a brief note on target setting for those that is that we're hoping that teams are able to uh, set targets for these um, that are uh, both aspirational and, uh, and realistic. Um, and uh, in terms of support for being able to set targets, uh, there's a link uh, later on in the presentation that can speak to um, a target setting tool to provide a bit of guidance there. Um, while, uh, while it's clear that uh, primary care impacts all three of these areas of focus, I think this third set of indicators that are uh, around screening and improving access to preventive care uh, is uh, obviously a place where it's going to require really deep engagement and involvement with primary care organizations. Um, and so uh, just want to note here, you know, um, during COVID, uh, certainly the rate of screening for cancer fell by almost 50%. Um, you know, we, uh, we know also that public health and primary care uh, plays such a massive uh, role in ensuring that people have appropriate access to screening. Um, and we also uh, know and want to promote the, the concept that uh, equity is um, certainly a large factor in the, the approach taken to address uh, care and screening for marginalized populace, populations is extremely important. Um, these work as a bit of a signal, I think, to uh, show what's happening regionally and provincially. Um, and of course, these can be combined with other organizational level indicators um, that will be able to capture uh, variation uh, in your OHDs. Um, and so the, the recommendation as a QI approach is to really start where you are uh, and to do what you can. Um, we know that these indicators uh, are a view, um, a view to uh, seeing what the, um, what the population health um, looks like within your community. Uh, and, um, and they can be further mined down with additional data sources uh, that David might be able to speak to, uh, to um, develop some really actionable uh, plans here. Um, the next slide uh, has to do with uh, patient attribution to OHDs. Um, so a number of you, I think, have asked about uh, how you can replicate data for your OHDs. Um, yeah and try to really find out like, uh, you know, is this something that could be done at the organizational level? Um, uh, Want to be clear that it's not expected uh, that primary care organizations can, uh, can mimic the data set uh, and really um, uh, drill down to their uh, own attributed population. Uh, there's not access to the same kind of um, uh, key, like the master key that, uh, that is uh, the, the tool to be able to uh, come to an attributed population. 
Um, and so um, we know that the methodology is imperfect and then will evolve over time. Um, the uh, patient attribution uh, for HCs is, is based on the study that was first conducted um, through ISIS. Uh, the, and uh, that it is not specifically based on geography where patients live, uh, but rather based on uh, with whom and where uh, they access care and the majority of their care. Um, the ministry's attribution methodology uh, does have uh, some attribution of patients to networks um, uh, that uh, might be outside of where they live, uh, but it is, it is following the ISIS uh, attribution uh, methodology. Uh, and that there are uh, more uh, guidance and um, uh, support information uh, to be able to explain it in a bit more detail. Um, and I think there's an example a little bit later on in the slide deck um, that, uh, uh, that will show you how uh, attribution for a particular region, uh, for a particular OHT, I mean, uh, really comes from uh, quite broadly across the region. Um, and I do know there, there are some questions coming up, and Mark, thanks for uh, addressing some of them while you can. Uh, we'll hope to be able to um, uh, jump in and, and start to speak to some of those um, after we get through some more of the slides. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, uh, yeah, a bit more specificity here on how the patients are actually attributed. Um, so first of all, uh, patients are linked to physicians through um, uh, recognition of their enrollment with primary care. And so that is based on uh, either their enrollment or health utilization, uh, regardless of where they uh, reside. Um, uh, over 90% of uh, insured patients, um, Ontario residents, were assigned to a network based on their enrollment with primary care. Uh, and then those that were not enrolled uh, were assigned based on the primary care provider with whom they access most of their primary care over a three year window. Um, those who had not used any primary care uh, service in that three year window were assigned to a network. Uh, that covered a, a similar geographic area where they live. Um, and then secondly, uh, primary care physicians are linked to a hospital where most of their patients were admitted um, for non maternal medical care. Um, and then to note also that uh, maternal medical care is excluded in the setup in order to better target uh, avoidable medical admissions, uh, noting that maternal admissions uh, were not uh, obviously avoidable. Um, and then there was a, a third step where specialists are principally linked to the hospital with which they currently hold a contract. So uh, a specialist that did not hold a contract then with a hospital or linked to the hospital listed uh, in their primary physician address uh, where they deliver the highest volume of, in, of inpatient services. Um, so uh, a fair bit of detail there. Uh, I, and I think um, uh, if that doesn't feel super clear at, at the moment, uh, that um, there is uh, some guidance documents that we can link to to uh, dig a bit deeper into those. Um, so just on the next slide is a quick example of uh, a visual representation of all attached patients attributed to the Mississauga OHT. Um, and so uh, obviously you can see here uh, with Mississauga being uh, down uh, close to the lake uh, on the sort of the left hand side, um, that uh, there are patients represented from uh, the, the distribution of, of scatter dots uh, that go much, much further than that. Um, so uh, again, to reiterate that the, the network maps and patient, patient attribution were based on how individuals access care rather than where they live. Um, and that um, because, of, uh, because of that, um, various teams uh, will not have really tightly defined geographic boundaries. Um, and then uh, just to note that, yeah, this information came from, um, uh, came from uh, data uh, that was uh, pulled together from uh, the Inspire PhD uh, team, uh, which includes um, uh, Dr. Rick Glazier uh, and, um, and um, I'm blanking on his name because it's too small for me to see, uh, Mike. And um, uh, just want to turn over here to, to David uh, to speak a bit more about uh, the primary care access uh, data reports. That's so, right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thanks for uh, everybody for joining. Uh, I'm David Kaplan. I'm a family doctor in North York. Um, I happen to be part of a, a family health team um, that's part of the North York Toronto OHT. Uh, and I'm also the vice president for quality at Ontario Health. I'm happy to chat today about the collaborative QIPs. So 
Um, the Ontario health teams, um, through work done uh, by ins the Inspire PHC team, um, led by uh, Rick Glazier and Michael Green, um, have made um, uh, primary care data reports available to all the OHTs. Um, the report actually is, is, is quite interesting. I, I think one of the most interesting things for me is as a clinician who works at the intersection of the 401 um, and um, the 404 uh, is seeing that the patients in our OHT cover like a huge geography. Like, so they don't all actually live or work or live near um, where we practice. Um, and then the, the detailed Excel file that you can download for each of your OHTs um, that um, has a really um, quite, uh, I would say, uh, interesting ways of cutting uh, the data that I think would help make a lot of um, interventions make sense. So by looking at the data, you can actually think about, well, in your geography, uh, sorry, in your OHT, um, for your population, what would an intervention look like by because of things like marginalization or um, because of the chronic diseases or other um, uh, aspects uh, of your patients if they're uh, rostered or unrostered? And I think that'll think that actually the unrostered versus rostered or having a care provider but not having a care provider really plays into the opportunity for OHTs, especially around uh, um, cancer screening. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, the team-based uh, primary interprofessional primary care uh, groups um, can already um, off, uh, access uh, staff that specialize in quality improvement and decision support. Um, all um, F and this uh, uh, both the FHT. It's not the FHT physicians, but actually any physician in a um, prime sorry in a, a PEM model. So these are. Uh, physicians that roster their patients, about 8,900 or so physicians uh, have access to their My Practice report. Um, there's a, actually a new indicator that's pretty exciting, which is antibiotic use uh, for physicians. Um, and then these reports are also rolled up at the level of a family health team, meaning that if you have different family health organizations that all contribute to one family health team, like in MyFit, which is made up of, I think, six FHOs, the FIT actually gets a breakdown by um, individual physician group. And so you can actually do some looking cross group to see if certain groups need uh, different implementation supports and others. Um, the practice profiles are available through the Alliance um, and the SAR report is also available uh, to physicians in um, patient uh, enrollment models. And the SAR report um, has individual patient level data uh, with regard to cancer screening metrics. Um, and then lastly, um, the Association of Family Health Teams of Ontario have a number of queries that have been created uh, that can sit on the front end of electronic medical records for most of the large uh, vendors in the province, uh, both for many of the things that uh, you're looking at in your collaborative QIP, but for other um, data elements as well. And they're worthwhile checking out. And when I finish talking, I can plop it in the chat if no one else has done that ahead of time. Next slide. The My Practice Report um, really is meant to be a quality improvement tool. Uh, it's meant to shine light uh, for, to individual clinicians, but also to whole FHOs or FHTs around where they can improve. Um, there's a dashboard at the beginning of the report, and the dashboard really tells you about where you're doing uh, well compared to everybody and, and where you're not doing well and where you could put at your focus. So it is a, a useful tool to decide whether or not, for instance, cancer screening for a certain group is a, a place of, of opportunity for improvement. You can imagine if a certain group um, had all of their indicators above 75th percentile, um, it may not be the group where as an OHT you'd want to put some resources. I'm not saying that not everybody can improve. Obviously, everybody can improve. But if you have perf uh, groups that are doing not as well, they may put up their hand and say, you know what, I'm really not doing as well with regard to my colorectal screening as my peers. Um, how can the OHT help me um, to, to improve? Um, there's a lot of change ideas that are available within these reports around best uh, practice around improvement. Um, 
And I do think there's an opportunity within uh, the primary care groups within an OHT to start thinking about um, being, you know, either transparent with how they're doing, but also um, having a process where people could raise their hand and say, <coughs> sorry, I can really use um, uh, help on one of my uh, metrics and it could be cancer screening, it could be diabetes or something else. Next slide. Um, well, there is a community of practice available on uh, our quorum uh, site. Uh, it's very easy. You just click through on the link and click sign up to create your account. Um, you can um, use the majority of quorum without signing up, but you can't um, do the really important thing, which is subscribe to updates unless you join. Um, and what that means is you don't have to keep on going back to the website to check for things. You'll actually be notified uh, when there are important and relevant um, tools or updates or educational activities uh, related to the collaborative QIP. Um, and so you will get the slide deck um, and these are clickable links and you'll be able to um, subscribe uh, to updates once you've been accepted into the community of practice. Next slide. The other resources uh, are have been are also publicly available. Um, this is the OM, the Ontario uh, Ministry of Health and Ontario Health uh, Central Program of Support website on the ministry's webpage. Um, I mentioned already the community of practice. Um, the Health Systems Performance Network um, has a number of both webinars and provider uh, patient experience surveys and evaluation reports that are available. And I think many of you are aware of RISE, which is the Rapid Improvement Support and Exchange Network that's been uh, around now for over two years supporting Ontario health teams. Uh, but again, this is a, a set of resources that are available to all Ontario health teams in the province, especially um, as they start to think about uh, things like population health. I, you know, with even within my own Ontario health team, uh, historically, there's been a lot of uh, sort of thought given to programs and services that would benefit patients in our geography. So, you know, rapid access, uh, care for seniors, um, uh, shut-ins, uh, a lot of the work we've been doing around vaccine. But I think actually the work around vaccine has started to let us think about uh, population health approaches and doing things a little differently. And, and that's where there's a huge opportunity, I think, in cancer screening, which has traditionally been um, sort of thought of as in two ways. One is obviously, uh, the Ontario health letters that we send out at a population health level to the whole province when they're eligible for screening or overdue for screening. But obviously many of us as primary care uh, nurse practitioners or family physicians um, will we'll do these uh, maneuvers in our office, we'll reach out proactively to our patients. Um, I think the opportunity for Ontario health teams is to start thinking about, well, how about the patients, the, you know, the, the hundreds of thousands of patients uh, that aren't linked to primary care um, that uh, may not have a, the access that they need and how can we start providing these screening maneuvers at a population level um, in certain areas, for instance, of our OHT that may be under uh, serviced uh, or may have uh, poor access to primary care. Next slide. And so with that, I think um, we're gonna bring the didactic part of this to a close and, and open up for a bit of a discussion um, on primary care engagement um, in the CQIP. Uh, I don't know if there were any questions. I'm looking at our conveners today. I, I have to, my screen went full, full screen here. So I, I'm looking to see if there's anything in the chat that people, um... So David, one question was, yeah. uh, could, could you discuss uh, whether the OHTs will be expected to drill down and focus on uh, specific subgroups within each indicator? For example, LGBTQ1A or, and uh, certain communities for PAP. So I don't think that's necessarily an expectation. I think that would be a very interesting thing for, for OHTs to think about when they look at their uh, population. When I think about my population historically, uh, let's say for pap smear screening, um, you know, I'll look at my list of patients and I'll have my secretary start calling from the A's. And of course, if you're in the first half of the alphabet, you probably have, uh, and you're overdue for your pap, you have a better chance of getting a call from my office. I'm not sure that's an equity-based approach to quality improvement. I think one of the opportunities here 
um, is to start thinking about how do we take a different approach to improvement when it comes to cancer screening? What are the lenses? If it, you know, what, what's the equity lens? Um, what's the, if you live in an area like Markham, um, do we do something different for people in certain areas of Markham where there's high incidence of diabetes, for instance, just to give people an example, as opposed to areas of Markham where there's a lower inc incidence of diabetes. So starting to really use some of the other tools um, to really almost take a clinical public health approach to this, uh, to these problems, as opposed to just a solely clear uh, clinical approach to, to these to these things. It, it reminds me of, of one of the principles of family medicine, right, which is um, we're a, a resource to, to our population. Um, and that has to translate now to not whether or not people seek care. So historically, we're a resource to our patients that come into our office, call, the, call us on the phone and want to come in and see us. How do we now reach out to the people who need care, who either have trouble accessing, don't realize they need care, um, or there's some other you know, systemic barrier for them to access care historically. I think one of the other areas for, that OHTs could focus on are the never screened. So you know, with the pandemic, we know there's gonna be people who are you know, six months or a year overdue for their pap smear, but what about the people who are seven years overdue for their pap smear or who have never had a pap smear, who uh, are now 30, 40, 50 years old? And what are, what's the way that we can reach out to those populations um, that we wouldn't do as individual providers necessarily. I think that there's an interesting question here uh, about how would an unattached person residing in a shelter access preventative cervical breast screening? Yeah, um, that's a great question. That, that's a great I'd question. I'd also ask the participants, they might want to chat in because I have seen yeah. some great examples from primary care. So that's what I was going to ask. I'd be curious. I'm sure our CHC partners have, have thought about this. Um, I do know that I have a meeting, um, I think it's later in the week, actually, uh, about priority health clinics. Um, and this came about, I think, through the Inner, health, Inner City Health Associates in Toronto. Um, so there's, I think there's a lot of different groups in the province thinking about um, these really marginalized uh, patients that don't have traditional access to primary care. But yeah, I'd love to hear from some of the other, maybe people can, you know, unmute themselves or put their hands up. Can we unmute Anne? Or Anne, can you yeah. unmute yourself? Yeah. yeah. In Haldeman and Norfolk, both, uh, both family health teams do uh, pap and sexual health clinic care for any member of the community, whether they are affiliated or not, or whether they uh, have an MD or not. It was an arrangement uh, we started through public health when they uh, stopped doing it. That's great. That's amazing. I know too from reading um, quality improvement plans, there was examples of like transportation being a, a, such a major issue, and you know trying to arrange for buses to take uh, women to mammography or um, you know different examples such as that. I'm trying to. See Cost of the, the other area that we've heard historically is cost of parking, even for the people who have vehicles, right? Going to a medical center, it could be, you know, $12 to park to get your mammogram. So there is the, this, the cost issue, even for people who have access to transportation. And I'm going to ask if we can unmute Jennifer Rayner. She's got some updates about the practice profiles and data availability. Hi, everybody. I'm trying to keep up. I'm trying to keep up to, on the uh, chat, but basically um, the practice profile, we've been working with ICS. The data should be coming soon. We were supposed to get it in November or December, but they got super delayed with um, COVID requirements. So um, you know, I, I'm, I think it'll be imminent. I'm expecting it in the next week or so. And that was for the community health centers, the Aboriginal health access centers. Um, we needed to open up an agreement with the Indigenous data team. So they're also working away on that and they're learning from the analysts that are doing the um, CHC reports. So I submitted an ARC to get that done for the um, health quality folks because we couldn't get the data otherwise. So I, I just went through the ARC, which is why it's gone on a different stream. Um, but both of those are being done. Um, you know, as soon as we get the data, we'll get the reports out. We have to turn all of that raw data into the uh, report. So 
We'll do it as soon as we get it. And can you comment on the NP uh, yeah, data? For sure. Yeah. So for, I know you've been working on this for a long time. Well, for nurse practitioners in community health centers and Aboriginal health access centers, um, their data has always gone into ICS and that data has always been included in our practice profile. So um, for us, it's nothing new. So um, yes, absolutely. The NPs are included in all of the measures for um, the CHCs and the Aboriginal health access centers. So someone's asking if the primary uh, care yeah. teams have received them. But I think I think Teresa, I looked up her name because I didn't recognize her name. I think she's from a family health team. She is, yeah. So I'm not sure. I think that's maybe Sandeep would have to answer that one. I, yeah, I can address that. So there's been, a, I think you're probably referring to the um, family health team level, uh, my practice reports. So we added the new indicator and with COVID, there's been a bit of a delay, but they will be coming out to executive directors uh, Teresa, so thanks for asking that question. There has been a delay. The individual physicians um, have and their FHOs have received their level of report, but not the FIT report. I've, I've seen a couple of, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm wondering if Sandeep wants to talk, she's got some notes about uh, patients and with transportation issues. I think this might be somebody who else who is logged in that somehow is showing up with Sandeep's name. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> all, all the comments in the chat that are from Sandy are actually not myself. So if folks want to oh. change their name and uh, comment in the chat, that would be great. <laughs> but so I, they but need I, to yeah. right, right click on their name and then it should, they can put in their proper name, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So you'll see change name and you can <laughs> do, you, do that. Well, but I thought I am, you were I am typing seeing, very quickly. <laughs> some of these Sandeeps have uh, some very um, interesting change ideas. Um, and I, I, I was wanting to mention some of them. So one um, person has mentioned a program called Screen for Life, uh, which is a cancer screening coach service um, for unattached patients out, uh, that's, I guess, in uh, Hamilton and Highway 17. And they're wondering about um, if there's ways to access that. So I don't know if there's anybody here who is more familiar with that um, coach service that knows if it's available elsewhere or if it has an analog that's available outside of that area. Um, and then another, Sandy has mentioned uh, the need for mobile, more mobile mammography clinics, which I think is, you know, potentially, I don't know, but maybe would that be something that an OHT could consider as a change idea? So one of the questions, David, that um, we've heard as in preparing this session was the, um, the people were wanting to know how were primary care being approached by OHGs and how are they sort of being brought into the fold? Yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I can speak to what, what I know is happening. There, I'm sure some of the other folks um, on the call, both from OH and elsewhere, would have uh, some examples as well. Um, many of the OHTs, some of them that are a little farther along, have created primary care um, associations, uh, a method by which you know physicians, especially those that are not on staff at a hospital, for instance, can put up their hand and say, I want to be part of the OHT. There's a whole bunch of benefits so that I want to, I want to gain uh, access to. Um, I want the supports uh, for uh, looking at my data, uh, vaccinating my patients. Uh, some of them have um, supported uh, physicians and, and others with calling patients, like lists of patients over 70 who haven't got their booster doses. So I, I think it's, it's a little different depending on which OHT you're in. Um, but uh, many of them have had primary care um, organizations or, or associations that have that have cropped up that are representing primary care at the governance level, but also providing service. Um, it's almost like the value proposition for a lot of these solo or small offices to be joining the OHTs. But I'd love to hear a bit more, maybe even uh, what's happening at some of the other um, OHTs across the province.
I, well, I'm well wondering. With that, there was a, another question um, that I think is helpful. Uh, and maybe Mark, you know the answer. Can individual organizations join the CQIP um, community of practice on Quorum or only the OHT leads was a question. So yes, absolutely you can. Um, it is meant for the point of contact people. So, but, um, so it may go into a bit more depth than you really wanna know, but um, you're certainly welcome. And I think the link to the, um, there's events. So for example, in the later parts of this deck, there's things like uh, HSPN is doing a, a data uh, session talking about segmentation. And I've just had a glimpse at that, which was you know, super interesting. There's a lot of things that have been recorded so that you could um, you could look at them with your at your own leisure. Um, I did want to tell people that we really had hoped with the CQIP that we would have had the primary care data <clears throat> sort of underneath or with the, the data that was attributed to the populations. But we just with the pandemic as well, we weren't able to get that data at the primary care levels to the OHTs. So we would imagine that they'd be asking you and particularly, you know, look at your data. And if you see that, you know, that there's a big area of opportunity or you have ideas, just, you know, tap on the door. And uh, because I think they'll be looking for that, that types of support. Um, I see Heather's got her hand up. Just to answer Dr. Kaplan's question about primary care being engaged by the OHT, the local OHT. So we are the Hearing Perth Area OHT, and we do have a um, primary care uh, group, uh, both on the organization of the executive director side, as well as on the physician side. So the physicians have their own primary care alliance group, and they three physicians sit on our implementation committee. Right. And then there's the primary care executive directors group that, you know, work on various, you know, COVID has been a big thing right now, but work on various um, ways that have to happen, as well as a digital, di digital work that reaches out to all the different partners and brings them into the OHT level, which then, in some cases, takes us up to the regional and provincial level to work on things such as right. the portals and the OAB and things like that. So it's yeah, I was going to say that's another that Heather, that's another perfect example of why it's helpful for clinicians to join the the um, these primary care groups to get access to things like OAB uh, for the OHT staff to help write the proposal. Like the, this, these have been real helpful in the last I'd say three months, four months to primary care access to dollars for virtual care, things like that. Um, one of the opportunities, though, um, I think would also be, you know, to go back to Anne's comment about the uh, PAPS and sexual health clinics, to um, write up some of these uh, for operationally and post them in quorum. And, and so that groups don't have to think about, well, how would I start, uh, you know, a sexual health clinic in my OHT? Um, and we definitely have staff uh, on my team um, who could sort of interview the people that run the clinic and, and help you write up a post uh, for a quorum to share. So uh, don't think that you need to um, have somebody uh, to write it up. We definitely have staff uh, in the quality branch at, at Ontario Health that can help uh, and just reach out uh, to, uh, to anybody and we can get you set up on that, especially if you have a program that's uh, really scalable. We'd love to hear about it. Yeah, there's a whole um, section called innovations so, and um, they're we're collecting those stories so that would be amazing. I see Gwen was asking about the subgrouping question about <clears throat> somebody's apparently said that this subgrouping on mandatory indicators or sorry that it's a mandatory section in the reporting tool and I just I'm very uh, close with the <laughs> reporting tool. So the only thing about QIP or the CQIP is that the indicators are to be mandatory. Uh, the subgrouping, you can bypass that question if you choose to. Um, and it also is open. So it may say, you know, I don't know, people who are homeless or, you know, certain people with mental health issues. It may have some, some, uh, prompts there, but if you chose 
there's also the option to describe. So you could say, you know, a specific geography that you wanted to target first. Um, I think the idea being that, uh, you know, to get people started at looking at the subgroups and where the area for opportunity is for those, um, those new change ideas that will help, help bring this along. So, Just to be a bit of a pause in the uh, the questioning, I know that there are some more slides, um, although they're mostly, I think, in the form of an appendix. But um, David or Mark or Margaret, did you want to um, address any of the other slides? Do you want to just pop them up and we'll sure. share those? So, Carrie, can, can you see them on my screen right now? I think I'm still sharing. Yeah. So this is uh, some of the examples from the um, inventory that's sort of being collected about innovative uh, things. So it, your little story could be as simple as something like this. When you're describing, you know, maybe you're working on transportation or um, mobile buses to get uh, to your populations. Um, it could be as simple as this as far as an example, but people could easily pick it up. And the other thing is then they can contact the OHT and say, you know, I'd like to hear more information on this. All right, next. Uh, another example. <clears throat> so I find this indicator very fascinating. <laughs> the rate of ED visits as first point of contact for MHA related care. And uh, so there's the two points of it. One is, um, have your patients been identified in primary care? Has that been coded in your primary care? And then on the other side, are there community mental health um, organizations and services available to support these people? And then uh, we do have some good examples of uh, segmented populations where people are really targeting in. And I know CHCs uh, have also, some of the other CHCs, this is a CHC, have uh, been doing like getting some academic literature. <clears throat> I'm sure Jenna could challenge you to put their article in about, um, there's a grouping in Toronto of a number that are working on uh, on this topic. And then our next, so these were just some quick examples. So again, uh, where people are working on the refugee, um, all kinds of opportunities to look at, you know, translation, cultural sensitivity. And uh, so at the same time as we're doing this, there's a data package uh, walkthrough with the OHTs and um, it, it is recorded. So you would be able to access that. Um, it also uh, talks to, so the uh, OHTs have a lot of um, metrics around uh, an evaluation. And again, a number of those are primary care related. So you, you might wanna have a look at you know, what their package looks like. And then I think we've got us the segmentation one. I found this fascinating. They were, you know, being able to split the um, OHT data by different uh, segments. And I think it'll really help to hone in uh, on particular indicators, what you might be trying to focus on. The links are inside these these slides. I think that's the last one. Oh, my practice. Yeah. Oh, is this going to be on, David? I know there was some um, talk. Of... I have a feeling that we may have moved this. Let me just double check. Uh, I believe it's been moved um, because of COVID. Yeah, I think we've delayed. Oh, this is the February one. Sorry. No, we delayed the January one, which was going to be on antibiotics. Prescribing, uh, this yeah. one, uh, I will, let me just check here. Sorry, everybody. Um, this one is still uh, 
plan to go ahead at the end of February. So yeah, so this will be um, really a deep dive in how to use your My Practice report for uh, looking at your cancer screening indicators, um, and then some of the change ideas that that are associated with that. I just I know that I've seen you do some of these uh, webinars where you actually can show in your system how you link it to your scheduling That's software right. and, and emailing your patients. Emailing and it's just like oh, amazing to see. You make it look so easy. <laughs> well, I think actually, you know, what what, what it is really is it, it shows the benefit of using some of the virtual tools. So for the, especially for the OHTs that have applied for some of the virtual care or online booking funding, it's a way to link running queries, thanks to AFTO that they've designed that match the my practice, um, you know, the my practice indicators, and then actually using some of those additional tools that many of your OHT members are now getting funded, like virtual care or online booking, to then get those patients in the door um, in a very efficient way, because it, it really decreases the administrative burden to be able to send out, you know, uh, an email securely to all your patients that are overdue for their PAP that comes from their physician uh, or their nurse practitioner, uh, and then it links them right to the online booking so that they can book an appointment. So yeah, there are some slick ways of doing it that we're going to be highlighting on the 28th. And just one question I see Teresa talking here about additional indicators in CQIP. So there are no uh, additional indicators in CQIP. It does allow for people to put in custom indicators, but the idea is to focus on those three main uh, areas of focus. So like the ALC, the mental health, and the preventative screening. So. Um, Oh, and thank you for getting those links in. I've kind of got a limpy computer today, so I appreciate you getting that. So Margaret, we'll give it to Margaret, David just, to wrap or? Oh, sure. Uh, Margaret, just a, just a uh, quick additional comment on um, yeah. on the additional indicators in, in the plan for us. Yeah. Uh, so for, for Teresa, uh, I think just to also underscore that if there are other indicators that teams want to include, uh, that is relevant to, to work that they have underway or that they see as a, as a strong area of focus, please, by all means, do add them in, right? So you mentioned them as, as the additional indicators um, or uh, complementary indicators. They certainly, teams certainly can uh, put those in and, uh, and, you know, we would encourage them to do that if that's, um, if they feel like that's a good representation for their, uh, for their populations. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's uh, 12.58, so I don't know if we have just a couple of minutes for closing comments, and then I'm just going to mention the evaluation survey at the very end. So um, maybe we'll go to the next slide. I believe that's fine. Yeah, so there it is. Uh, I want to thank, I just got it up there just before the, if it closes by mistake. Um, I do want to thank everybody uh, for uh, joining today. You know, it's been um, a, a real hard time, I think, for everybody with everything that's being placed on um, primary care, uh, if it's vaccination or just learning how to see people appropriately digitally um, and, uh, you know, dealing with our own kids that are being learning from home or uh, being sick ourselves with COVID. And so I really do want to say thank you on behalf of Ontario Health for really the the great work that the sector has done and I think you know uh, there's been some maligning of the of the sector and I think that we know at Ontario Health that the data uh, doesn't bear that out look if you actually look at the data primary care clinicians are working harder than ever and, and really have stepped up to support uh, all aspects of their patients and and, and the management to the pandemic. So I do want to thank everybody, and not just for coming today, but for everything uh, that you've been doing uh, over the last almost two years. Thank you so much, David. Um, and thanks to uh, David, Mark, and Margaret um, for being here today, uh, to Sandeep for uh, her help with uh, the moderation and also backup technical support. Um, I'd like to thank all of our partners at uh, AFTO, the NPLCA, and the Indigenous Primary Healthcare Council, as well as Ontario Health for helping to make this webinar happen. And I wanna thank everybody who took the time to join us today and uh, share questions 
questions and comments. Um, as mentioned, we will be following up with an email that will link to the recording. Um, it'll take a bit to clean up the subtitles, but hopefully that will be in the next day or two, um, as well as some of the, um, the slide deck. And I will pull out some of those um, links in the slide deck to resources uh, that seem to be uh, particularly um, uh, pertinent. And um, of course, um, uh, you know, we would love to hear back from you. So uh, there is a QR code up on the slide there you can use to go to um, an online version of our uh, sur uh, evaluation survey, and we will send the link out to it in that follow up email as well. Or um, you can just hang on at the end when I close the webinar and it will pop up uh, within Zoom for you as well. Uh, thanks uh, once again, uh, and I hope you all have yeah, there, uh, there, safe and happy time. Go on. <laughs> there, was one, there was one comment about the organizational uh, quip. Um, there, the, there is instruction will be coming out shortly. We're just waiting uh, for uh, ministry approval to get it out to everybody. Wonderful. I know we've been getting a lot of questions about that yeah, too. So I'm sure. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. And uh, have a wonderful uh, afternoon, everybody. Stay safe. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.